Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's uh, definitely one of the favourite parts of my job, coming out and talking to people, talking to trustees, talking to people who work in charities. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, Ian, am I standing in the wrong place? <laughs> I like to move around and I'm not allowed to move around. Um, also, just to say that this mic is gently choking me. So if I go kind of blue and fall over, would somebody come and pick me up? Um, what we're going to do uh, in a very brief presentation really is talk a little bit about uh, our definitions of safeguarding and a little bit beyond that, but we're con concentrating on safeguarding today. Talk a little bit about why it's important, um, how charity trustee duties intersect with that, what you need to be thinking about as charity trustees, I talk, just briefly touch on the notifiable events regime and you might have some questions on that and then talk about our safeguarding steps. Um, one of the things that happened when all this safeguarding stuff hit the press was there was quite a conflation, uh, quite a bringing together of different concepts in one place, making it quite confusing, I think, for charity trustees and others. And one of the things we've tried hard to do in our guidance, we've got interim guidance up on the website at the moment. Um, it's very close to the final guidance, but because we're doing a lot of thinking about this at the moment, we've left it as interim for the time being. But what we tried to do was be very clear about what we were talking about in that guidance, but some of the other stuff that you needed to get right as well in order to make sure safeguarding was working in your organisation. So what do we mean by safeguarding? For us, safeguarding is the action that an organisation will take to promote the well-being of the beneficiaries, of vulnerable beneficiaries, children and vulnerable adults. And that includes physical, emotional and all that stuff. That is the very heart. That is safeguarding. However, as we all know, if you want to get safeguarding right as an organisation, you need to make sure other stuff is right. You need to make sure your organisation is working properly. You need to make sure it's a safe and secure people, place for people to work. You need to make sure your employment, your employment laws, your employment procedures are correct. And you've kind of got to build an organisational culture that really works to make sure that safeguarding is, is, is working appropriately in your organisation. So that is what safeguarding is for us, that, that middle bit, that heart in the middle there. And that's the heart of what charity trustees need to be thinking about. So why is it important? I mean, obviously that's kind of almost a stupid question, but why is it important? Um, it's not just, it's not important for any, you know, um, any reputational reason, although that kind of comes into the overall trust and confidence that people might have in the sector. Fundamentally, it's a right of beneficiaries to feel safe of vulnerable beneficiaries to feel safe, to be treated with dignity and respect. That is the very heart. That is why it's important to us as a regulator and to charity trustees um, as a whole. But in a way, people often say, well, you know, should charities be held to a higher level of, of, of scrutiny than others? I don't think so, really. I think any organisation should be held to the same level of, of scrutiny. But it's absolutely definitely true that charities often play a very particular role in society. They're often trusted to look after the most vulnerable populations, the most vulnerable beneficiaries. So in fact, there's a particular role there that charities have, and therefore it becomes even more important that charities get this bit right. And there is that kind of transparency bit if, if, if about reporting. There's, a, there's another reason why uh, people got very upset about the stuff that went on in the newspapers. Um, uh, newspapers, I sound very old fashioned, newspapers and everywhere else, um, was that there was a lack, it, it was felt that there was a lack of transparency and that people weren't being truthful and honest about what was going on. And a big part of what builds trust and confidence in charities is that transparency bit, is that truthful bit, is people knowing that they can trust you as an organisation. And finally, and this is not the most important bit, sometimes, you know, we put this in and people go, well, it's not just about reputation. No, it's not just about reputation. But if you get any of this safeguarding stuff wrong, as we saw recently, then it will not just undermine the, 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 the faith and the trust that people have in your charity, it will also undermine possibly the trust that people have in other charities across the sector and the sector as a whole. So it is a very, very important piece to get right. I'm not going to talk about charity trustees' duties in detail because that is the, the fantastic Laura Anderson's job and she will do that brilliantly in a minute. But charity trustees' duties speak very directly to this piece of work. Because um, if you look at the second one there, you must act with care and diligence. First of all, you must act in the interest of the charity, but you must act with care and diligence. And if you think about your charity and you think about who you're working with and you think about your beneficiaries, then actually acting with care and diligence really talks to how you're looking after that population. 
And when we talk about acting with care and diligence, and Laura will go into this in more detail, then we're really talking about a, a, a level of care that goes way beyond the level of care that you, that you would think about looking after your own affairs, but actually a level of care looking after somebody else's affairs. So it's quite a high level of proof. So act with care and diligence, and therefore making sure that you get safeguarding right for your beneficiaries is a key part of what, uh, of what tr trustees are charged with doing in charity law. Down here, and Laura will talk about this in, in a bit more detail, is it's a collective responsibility. So while as an organisation, if you're a big charity, you'll be delegating a lot of what that, that practical kind of safeguarding stuff, you'll be delegating that, you'll be thinking about you know, how that fits into your policies and procedures, but overall, it's a collective responsibility of the charity trustees, of your board, of your committee, of whatever it's called, to make sure that that piece, uh, you're getting that piece right. So what you should be doing, the first point is actually about that wider environmental stuff. But one of the key things to getting safeguarding right in your organisation, not surprisingly, is making sure you've got the policies and procedures in place. However, it's not just about getting some nice shiny policy that you pick off some you know, website or, or somebody gives you um, and you go, well, that's great, we've got a policy, tick, tick, tick. As we all know, and I'm sure you all have great experience of this, is actually making sure it's embedded in your organisation and then it's fit for purpose. There was quite a lot of, um, one might say, slightly knee-jerker reactions after the stuff hit the press uh, recently to say, well, get a policy in place in, in four weeks or we won't give you, you know, we can't give you any more cash. That's never going to work. If you want to get an appropriate policy, you need to work with your beneficiaries, you need to work with your staff, you need to work with your other trustees to make sure you're getting it right. So it's not just about having a policy, it's not just about having a procedure, but it's making sure that that's embedded in your organisation and that you have clear lines of responsibility, that people know what they need to be doing. That's something that often falls down. That you might have a great policy, you might have a great procedure, but because you're not keeping them up to date, because perhaps you're not doing the training, because perhaps you don't have the time to actually invest in this stuff, then what's happening is people are not clear about what they're meant to be doing, and that's where it can actually go wrong. And then you need to make sure you're being transparent about when things go wrong, so reporting issues to the appropriate authorities. Now, as David said, very often on, on serious safeguarding issues, we are not, we are not the safeguarding police. You know, we're, we're the charity regulator. What we are concerned about is that trustees are doing the right thing. But we do have a reporting regime, but there will be other people that you need to be reporting to if stuff goes wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about notifiable events um, to make that clear for you. So that's what you should be doing. I'm going to talk briefly about our notifiable events regime. And there may be people, I'm not going to ask people to put up their hands <laughs> who's had a notifiable event with Oscar. But we've had quite a number, <laughs> we've had quite a number over um, the last two years. It's only been in, it's only really been going now for two and a half years. Um, and in total, we've probably had about, between, we've had about 200 notifiable events over that time. But that's over all the different areas that we ask people to notify, notify us on. Um, and for instance, what, what David was talking about, fraud and cybercrime, <laughs> that's actually our biggest number of stuff that's coming in in terms of notifiable events. It's, it's definitely not safeguarding. But what is the regime and why is it there? Well, we started the regime because the idea was really that we wanted to get ahead of the problems. If we want to be a proportionate and preventative regulator, we need to support charity trustees to do that. So rather than wait till some problem gets really naughty and it's not solved and then all the trustees walk away and then it's a total disaster and then it's the press and it's all mess, we're asking people to report to us at a time that they've had some time to think about what's happening, that they know what they're going to be doing about that, that the trustees have had time to kind of actually take some action on that or, or decide what action they're going to take, and then report it to us. And of all the ones that we've had, very uh, fortunately, um, and maybe not surprisingly, because it's usually organisations with very good governance that report to us, um, we rarely have to do very much. What happens is somebody will report to us, um, they have already taken the steps or they're, they're very clear about what steps they're going to take and then we go, oh, that's great, thanks very much, keep us updated, maybe if there's some, something in the future. For a few of them, we have to signpost and say, well, actually, maybe you need to think about this. We'll maybe signpost to some support. Um, we'll maybe say, oh, well, actually, you know, you haven't reported that fraud to the, you know, the appropriate police, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll do some signposting. And only in a couple of cases have we had to actually escalate that to become an inquiry. But even when we've done that, the, the charity trustees who've reported that to us are clear that that's the step we're going to take. 
So it means we're all much better informed at the right time to be able to take the right action. And it puts us all in a much stronger position because on, on a couple of occasions already, we've been able to say when some, um, some kind of, uh, some kind of, some reporter has called up and said, oh, terrible story here about blah, 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 what, what, what are you doing about it? And we can say, well, actually, we've heard about this. The trustees are doing something about it. All good, nothing to look at. <laughs> it puts us all in a stronger position. We can all be much more comfortable about what, what is going on within the charity. And it's more of a problem, in fact, if people don't report to us. So if, 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 if something has happened that's pretty serious in your charity and you haven't reported to us and then we discover it because somebody else has raised a concern and we have to go in and, and, and open an inquiry on that, then we're much more likely to think, mm, governance here not so great because, in fact, they're not being transparent at the right moments with the, with the regulator. Now, people who have read the guidance sometimes say, well, it's not prescriptive enough. You're not telling us what, you, what, what, what it is that we need to tell you. And we have kept it fairly high level, and that's for a very good reason. The good reason being that there's 24,000 charities that are all doing different things, and, and what is a notifiable event for one charity will not necessarily be a notifiable event for another. Now, I won't use the safeguarding to, to make an example here. It's much better thinking about, say, financial loss. If you're an organisation that is a £50,000 organisation and you've lost a grant for 30000 that you've had for the last 10 years, well, that opens you up to the possibility of having to think about winding up. You may not be able to carry on anymore. There's some risks associated with that, and we can be much more helpful with the wind-up process before um, this all happens rather than after. So you might want to inform us about that. If you are a £10 million organisation, how many £10 million organisations do we have in the room? <laughs> oh, Gibby, Gibby, do you? <laughs> that's very nice. Not very many, because most of them will be small. But if you are a £10 million organisation and you lose a £30,000 grant, that is probably not a notifiable event because that is not going to affect your ongoing running of the organisation. It's not going to undermine your organisation. You're not likely to have to wind up. So you wouldn't report that to us. So it is something that the trustees have to decide is something that is a risk to their organisation. It should be very much linked up to the way that the organisation is managing risk. In terms of safeguarding, the same is true. However, of course, uh, we would always say that with safeguarding events in an organisation, charity trustees should be erring on the side of caution. If you feel something significant is happening there, some safeguarding event is happening, then you may want to uh, alert us to that. You probably will want us to alert us to that. Um, we would say, again, that you do need time as charity trustees to, to have some understanding of what's going on and have some understanding of what you're going to do about it before you report. So um, when we say report to us as soon as you can, it does mean to have some consideration. But with safeguarding events, again, we would err on the side of caution of reporting relatively early because these are the kind of events that can maybe hit the press or can become quite serious quite quickly. So um, again, it's up to the charity trustees to decide at the right moment to report to us, but to make sure that these, these, these very, very critical safeguarding events are reported to us at the, at, at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, again, we know there are safeguarding events that will not be reported to us. We know, and um, we've seen, we've had a couple of meetings with, say, big care providers. And the safeguarding events that have to be reported to the care inspector and so on, when you know, there's been just a slight uh, misadministration of medicine or so on, very tiny safeguarding events would not be things that would threaten the fabric of your organisation, would not be things <laughs> that were highly risky. So, again, your organisation will have a good understanding of the risks your organisation is facing. And we do only want to hear about the things that are notifiable because in this day and age when we talk about getting the data that we get to be able to use it appropriately, we don't want lots of stuff that you just have to you know, regurgitate to us that's not going to be useful either to us or to yourselves. Um, so maybe just to go back on that safeguarding bit, err on the side of caution. If you have a, a, a serious safeguarding issue, we would want to hear about it, but we would still want you to have time to think about it, to consider what you're going to do so that you can actually reassure us as charity trustees that you know what you're going to do, that you know how you're going to go forward with that particular problem that you have in your organisation. You may want to ask questions about that after. What are we doing at the moment? We've produced our interim guidance, so hopefully people have had a chance to look at that. We've got a little video um, uh, about, uh, basically about the key principles of the guidance. Um, I think the most important thing that we're doing is that, that we're trying to work with key partners across the sector 
to build up confidence in this area of work. Um, we have seen, uh, since the stuff at the press, we've seen a lot of very good practice on safeguarding. Um, what we want to do is to try to make sure that we can make, um, the, do what we can to make sure the practice can be as good across the whole of the charity sector within Scotland, or certainly the charity sector that's working with vulnerable beneficiaries. So we're working with um, other partners, with Scottish Government, with SEVO particularly, to try to look at what we can do um, to actually build up um, strength in this area of work. Uh, and that will include safeguarding, but it will also start to work on some of these other issues that are very important that organisations need to be getting right, uh, such as whistleblowing or um, cultural change and all those kind of things which are a bit more difficult to work on in a concrete way. So we'll be looking at how we can support the sector on those areas as well going forward. Just going to finish with our little steps that are in our guidance, um, with sort of a bit of a recap. The, the first thing to, to really, that you really need to do is to make sure that you know what your duties are. So that whole, you know, what are your charity trustees' duties and understand that safeguarding falls very clearly within some of those. Know your other statutory duties. Depending on your organisation, you will probably have duties towards other, um, other um, regulators. Be appropriately trained. And I think the appropriateness is very important because, again, um, a simple safeguarding policy that works well um, is, is much better than a very fancy, you know, gold-plated safeguarding policy that doesn't work at all. So getting an appropriate policy and making sure that, that your staff are trained in that is very important. Um, and, and building it into the, the, the approach that your organisation takes to risk is pretty fundamental. Policies and procedures, I've talked about that, and making sure that they're implemented and understood and that people understand what their roles are in that. Uh, and that it's embedded in, in, in an overall culture within an organisation that sees safeguarding as just something that you do. It's just something that's embedded in your organisation. It's just something that everybody understands what their role is and, and they're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. What's also very important in terms of this wider cultural issue is making sure that you have good concern raising um, policies. And this is true for anything. It's particularly true for safeguarding. But when we talked about fundraising a couple of years ago, which was my last big hobby horse, that was, um, that was, a, that was also a big thing. Do you, do you have the appropriate procedures within the charity to make sure that people can raise concerns safely and they feel confident in being able to do so? And that you, have a, that you know that you can deal with them, that you're, you're safe and you're confident enough to be able to deal with these concerns. And then when something does happen, because I think this is the important piece of the puzzle that's always important to admit, you would, could have the best policies and procedures, you could have the best employment policies, you could have the best ways of dealing with stuff, but sometimes people just do horrible things. So if you do get an incident that, 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 that shakes you up a bit and that kind of is very <coughs> negative in terms of safeguarding for your organisation, that is a good opportunity to learn from and reflect, check that your policies are right. They may be right, if not, change them. Did something fall down in your procedure? Did something fall down in the way that people understood their roles and responsibilities? And then learn from that and then make sure that uh, you update your policies and procedures accordingly. So that's me. Um, but now I'm going to hand you over to the exciting bit because we've got uh, Volunteer Scotland who are going to talk about the duty to refer. What we are going to talk about is the duty to refer, which is if you are a charity or any other organisation that is working with children or protected adults, then under the PVG legislation, you have a legal requirement to pass on information to the PVG barring lists if the relevant criteria are met. That being, if somebody has behaved in an inappropriate fashion towards a vulnerable individual or individuals, within your group. Now, at present, there are around about 5,700 people across the country who are barred from doing the regulated work with vulnerable individuals. As you see there, we've got it split into three different sections. Red section, the biggest part there is 64% of 5,700 people are barred from working with children. It is therefore an offence for you as an organisation to employ any of those individuals in a position that falls under the PVG scheme that is working with children. Same way there, 9.5% are barred from working with adults. You cannot employ individuals who are barred from working with adults in an adult position that falls under the PVG scheme. 
And there you've got 26.5% are barred from working with both children and adults within the PVG scheme. So they cannot do any regulated work at all under PVG. But for the system to work, for people to be put on to these barring lists, as we say, it is a legal requirement for you, if you are an organisation that is doing the work, to pass on information if the criteria are met. That being, first off, the individual is permanently removed from the regulated work that they have been doing. Now, that can be you as an organisation dismiss them, that can be they resign, that can be particularly sort of in the charitable sector, the funding for a project ends and they leave. For whatever reason, if they have been permanently removed from the regulated work, that's the first part of the criteria. The second part there being that the grounds have been met, those grounds being that they have behaved in an inappropriate fashion in one or more of the five headings there towards vulnerable individuals. So they have, for example, physically caused them harm. They have placed somebody at risk of harm through, for example, a lack of health and safety. They have engaged in inappropriate conduct involving pornography. They have engaged in inappropriate sexual conduct. They've been saying things of a sexual nature to vulnerable individuals that you would not want them to do. They have also been, for example, giving inappropriate medical treatment. So if any of you are involved in organisations where it is involved, uh, for example, giving out medication to individuals at certain times, somebody who refuses to give out that medication would be classed as being behaving in an inappropriate fashion can also cover, for example, the supply of illegal and unauthorised drugs. Now, what is deemed to be inappropriate behaviour? We've got a list there. So we're starting off with the more serious items, sexual abuse, physical assault, supplying the illegal or unauthorised drugs, emotional abuse, coercion, neglect, inappropriate physical restraint, as we said, failure to follow health and safety, the use of inappropriate language. You're working with vulnerable individuals. What you deem to be inappropriate within the five headings is going to fall down to who you're working with in terms of the vulnerable individuals and what work your staff, your volunteers are doing with those individuals. And if they are behaving in an inappropriate fashion and you do permanently remove them, then, as we say, you are legally required to pass on the information to the PVG system. So... That inappropriate behaviour, though, it has to be against children. It has to be against protected adults. So I keep picking on David here when I'm doing these. So he's been doing a wide selection of criminal offences over the past few weeks, it has to be said. So David earlier was talking about, you know, Oscar gets its funding from the Scottish Government. So tomorrow, Oscar finds out David spent all the money in his, you know, holidays in the Caribbean. Yeah. Oscar wouldn't have to pass that information to the PVG system because David's not doing work with children with protected adults. But if David was the head, let's say, of an adult project for people with dementia and he siphoned money from those individuals to fund his holidays, then if the organisation removes him, that would be a referral ground because that is inappropriate behaviour towards a vulnerable adult. He has, for example, you know, uh, neglected that person's need by using money that was for their care to spend on his trip to the Caribbean. You're not planning on going to the Caribbean, we have to say at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the inappropriate behaviour is it also doesn't have to be whilst the person is actually working for you. If you decide to remove an individual from the work that they are doing with you with vulnerable individuals because information has been passed to you about their general behaviour, let's say, outside of work, then you can remove that individual and refer them to the PVG scheme. So, for example, we'll go with Jude this time. Somebody comes to you tomorrow and says, did you know... Jude's been arrested for hitting a child, uh, you know, on Prince's Street. And we said, oh, no, didn't know that. We're a children's organisation. We discover that Jude has actually been arrested and charged with hitting a child, assaulting a child. If we then remove her, even though the inappropriate behaviour hasn't been while she's been physically working for us, 
the referral grounds are still met, you still have to make the referral because that removal has been caused by her being inappropriate towards a vulnerable individual. Allegedly. Allegedly, we should say, yes. We should, well, hmm, don't know about that. Uh, an individual who you are reporting to the PVG system, we should say at this point, there does not have to be a conviction through a court of law for that person to be barred and placed on the, uh, on the barred list under the PVG system. The PVG system is working that that in, on the basis that the individual is going to be barred on the balance of probability that they have behaved you know, inappropriately towards a vulnerable person. So there doesn't have to be a situation arising where you dismiss the individual and pass that information on to the police for them to take it through the courts, etc. It is just if you remove the individual, because as we got there at the bottom, you know, the use of inappropriate language. So I don't know if any of you are, for example, sports organisations. If you've got a coach who's continually swearing at the children and he's coaching, you might say, nope, we're going to remove you. That would be a referral matter under the PVG system, but you wouldn't have to pass that on to the police. Other side of that as well is you should not rely, if it is a police matter, on giving the information to the police and then passing it to the PVG system. If that individual does end up being barred through a court process, etc., then uh, Andrew, who's from Disclosure Scotland at the back there, and his colleagues, they will look at the system to see whether or not you as an organisation have placed a referral into the system because you are legally required to do so. So no matter what the circumstances, if the criteria are met, you should make the referral to the PVG system. Now, something that does come up from time to time, what if information is passed to you and the individual has already left your organisation. They've already gone. Somebody who's, you know, in receipt of your services, didn't want to say anything because they were being bullied by a staff member, by a volunteer. If that person is gone, allegations are made, you investigate that allegation. And if your conclusion is that at the end of your investigation, you would have removed that person if they were still working for you, then you are still legally required to make the referral to the barring lists, even though the person is no longer there. And that's a sort of, uh, questions bit. I will now answer the question at the front end, which was, are you required to do the PVG checks? Right. Uh, this may come as a shock to some individuals here. Technically, it is not a legal requirement to do a PVG check. Uh, under the current PVG legislation, it is effectively your decision as an organisation as to who you would PVG check and when you would PVG check them. However, we do have to say that if you are found, for example, to be employing a barred individual, uh, then technically you could be in breach of the PVG legislation. And the only way you can find out if an individual is barred is by doing a PVG check. Uh, so technically it's not a mandatory system, but if you like, it's a mandatory by the back door. And we should say at this point that the PVG legislation, uh, for those of you who know it was out for public consultation earlier in the year about making changes to the system. And part of those changes are that come the implementation of the amendments, hopefully in <laughs> 2020, the PVG system will become mandatory at that point. So if you are doing what's currently regulated work and what may be a protected rules going forward, then you will be legally required to do the checks for everybody who does meet the criteria. Uh, 